You're watching Eye on Africa here on France 24. I'm Julia Kim, and these are the headlines on the continent. Lesotho's Prime Minister is a no-show at court to face murder charges. Thomas Tabane denies fleeing justice, saying he had a medical appointment in South, South Africa. Algerians flood the streets of the capital to mark the one-year anniversary of their peaceful Herak protest movement, which unseated longtime president Abdelaziz Bouteflika. And climate change confusion over the Victoria Falls, as recent publicity of its dry season leads to plummeting visitor numbers. But first, he was meant to face murder charges for the killing of his former wife. But Lesotho's prime minister skipped his trial, going instead to South Africa. Thomas Tabane's office says he's there for medical reasons, but police have warned that if he attempts to flee justice, they'll issue an arrest warrant. The premier is accused of ordering the assassination of his spouse back in 2017, just two days before he took office. He and Lipolelo Tabani were embroiled in a bitter divorce at the time. Now, Jane Fanagan joins us live from Cape Town to tell us a bit more. Jane, uh, take us through today's events for us. Well, it was widely anticipated that Tom Tabani would appear before magistrates in Maseru this morning, and there was a, a, a large media turnout, and the Prime Minister's own lawyer turned up apparently fully expecting that his client would be there. After a lengthy delay, it emerged that the Prime Minister had a long-standing medical appointment in South Africa and wouldn't be turning up. This caused some confusion as the police had been given reassurances that the Prime Minister would answer three charges before magistrates this, mo this morning. And then there was a, a rather confused message when the Prime Minister's son said his father had been taken suddenly ill last night and had been rushed to protect Victoria, uh, the South African capital, today for emergency medical treatment. For now, the police said they're willing to give him the benefit of the doubt, since the Prime Minister's office has said that he has no uh, reason to try and evade justice and that he will definitely be reporting to face charges as soon as he's back in the kingdom. So for now, the police do seem to be giving him the benefit of the doubt. But again, another real unprecedented crime novel of a day in sleepy Lesotho. Now, um, are people confident that justice will be done given that this crime occurred back in 2017? It's been almost three years now. Absolutely. Uh, we didn't hear anything about this, this case. It seemed as though the trail had gone cold for two and a half years uh, with uh, no new leads on the murder of the First Lady until December when the police uh, revealed that actually Thomas Tabani himself was linked to the crime scene by his phone, that a call had been traced between the Prime Minister's phone and the scene of his wife's murder. And that was uh, a shocking revelation. And since then, things have moved quite quickly. The, uh, the current First Lady, Masaya Tabani, has already appeared in course, court facing murder charges, and next month is due to go on trial. But it, it, whether or not the Prime Minister himself will absolutely uh, feel the, the full force of the law remains to be seen. And I think there is a lot of scepticism uh, among the population because the prime minister has not been a man to date who's shown much uh, willingness to uh, for, uh, for the law to take his course. He's been under pressure to resign for some time now by his own party. Yesterday, he finally said he would be stepping down for health reasons, because he's getting on, he's 80 years old, but he certainly wouldn't be going anywhere till July. So this is somebody who won't be, this is somebody who won't be rushed. I think we're waiting to see really how determined the police are to bring this matter to, uh, to uh, some sort of resolution. Okay, Jane Flanagan, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much for that update. Jane Flanagan reporting to us there from Cape Town. Now, from friends to foes to friends again, South Sudan's President Salva Kiir has appointed Riek Machar to be the country's first vice president. It comes a day after the feuding leaders agreed to form a long-delayed unity government, a crucial step towards ending six years of war. That conflict began in 2013 when Kiir sacked his then-vice president, Machar, who went on to form a rebel faction. 
Their feud cost the lives of 400,000 people and sparked the biggest refugee crisis since the 1994 Rwandan genocide. Now, huge crowds in the Algerian capital are marking the first anniversary of the Hirak, the country's biggest protest movement in decades. It succeeded in ending Abdelaziz Bouteflika's 20-year rule last April without spilling a drop of blood. But protesters' momentum has slowed with the election of a Bouteflika ally as president in December. For a 53rd consecutive Friday, many are still demanding radical change to the political establishment. France 24's Monsef Ait Kaisi is in Algiers for us. Huge crowds gathered for the 53rd consecutive and relentless week of popular mobilization, especially to celebrate the first anniversary of the Hirak. The protesters have taken to the streets of Algiers and other cities of the country. Uh, this day was actually the occasion to celebrate the pacifism, the determination and the efforts of all those millions of citizens who were mobilized for 365 days and who managed to stay united. The demands actually are the same. The departure of the figures of the old system, uh, freedom, uh, independence of justice and the press, people don't want repression and intimidation anymore. Uh, they have also called for the release of imprisoned journalists and prisoners of opinion. Uh, there was also a recurrent slogan this Friday, I quote it literally, we didn't come to celebrate, we came to get you to leave. Uh, demonstrators were probably referring to the decision taken on Wednesday by the president, who is challenged by these same protesters. Uh, the decision actually to decree February 22nd National Day. In fact, the citizens to whom I spoke explained to me that it is certainly a symbolic date that must be national, but that is a date that must belong only to the people. Uh, the objective for the demonstrations uh, was to remain peaceful, festive, to enjoy this day a year after the beginning of the popular uprising, while preparing for another mobilization this Saturday. Uh, some people are even still on the street and plan to spend the night there until tomorrow. Now, in other news, Rwanda has given Uganda one month to verify reports of anti-Rwandan rebel groups operating in its territory. Now, this comes as the two neighbours prepare to reopen their shared border. Rwanda abruptly closed it last February, severing a major economic land route. It's blamed Uganda for supporting rebels and for torturing its citizens. Uganda, meanwhile, has accused its neighbour of espionage. But both countries have made strides in normalising relations with prisoner exchanges and most recently the signing of an extradition treaty. And finally, it seems that not all publicity is good publicity. In recent months, photos of the Victoria Falls have been widely circulated as the latest natural wonder to fall victim to climate change. The images, though, only tell part of the story. But as James Vecina reports, the damage is done. It's publicity that tour operators would rather have avoided. Images of a dried up Victoria Falls sparked panic after they were posted online over the past months. A frenzy that's only got worse when Zambian President Edgar Lungu joined in, warning of the effects of climate change on the world's heritage site, which sits on the border of Zimbabwe. Every year, water on the Zambian side of the falls almost completely dries up. And while water levels were lower than in previous years, the damage was already done as tourists cancelled their trips to the site. It had actually a huge negative impact because many tourists, they cancelled their trips to the Victoria Falls because they heard that the Victoria Falls is no more. They heard that the Victoria Falls is dead. In 2019, tourism in Zambia dropped by 25%. I laid two off at the end of December because we just can't afford to keep everybody going. As much as I didn't want to do it, and it's very difficult. Uh, you know, they've got families, they've got kids at school, they've got mouths to feed. But I had no choice, absolutely no choice. The falls are now flowing again on their entire length, but the country is still recovering from a severe drought. A shorter rainy season has caused chaos for local farmers, and over two million people are in desperate need of food aid. And that's it from me. There's more news coming up next here on France 24. Stay tuned.